I'm uh, Frederick Megre. I'm a prof of faculty of law, co-director of the Center for Human Rights and uh, Legal Pluralism. Uh, I'm very happy to um, uh, uh, organize this uh, this event and and uh, uh, welcome to those of us who uh, those of you who are, who are joining us. Um, the idea here was to take advantage of the fact that uh, Professor Hernandez uh, happened to be visiting uh, Montreal from where he is uh, originally, as it, as it happens, uh, to have him give a talk. Uh, there were a few uh, intervening events that uh, mean that he's now actually no longer uh, uh, in Montreal, but back uh, uh, in Europe. Um, but we thought um, it would be a great opportunity uh, anyhow, just to, um, you know, get uh, him to sort of uh, uh, talk to us and, and talk to students in particular about his experience uh, as an international lawyer. Uh, professor Hernandez is, is currently a professor at the University of Leuven. Um, uh, he was previously at the uh, at Durham uh, University uh, um, and uh, in the Netherlands as well. Um, but before that, a long, long time ago, uh, he was a he did the uh, his LLB BCL uh, with us at the uh, Faculty of Law. So we're great believers in making the most of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, in-house resources, as it were. And uh, Glider, you're always welcome at McGill. I don't think the center existed when uh, when you were here, uh, but it's good to have you back. Uh, Glider, you know, really straddles worlds, and I think Vass, you know, he's a, obviously trained in Quebec, but uh, spent a lot of time in The Hague, uh, notably uh, working at the International Court of Justice, uh, and he's written very extensively on the range of uh, international law topics. He's a rare thing these days. He's a generalist international lawyer. He's at ease in a range of uh, domains and uh, areas and encourage you to discover his writing. It's always very uh, compelling and, and, uh, and eye-opening. Uh, so I won't say more. Uh, this is going to be fairly uh, free-flowing. The, the uh, idea is for uh, Glider to begin uh, with a kind of uh, a quick presentation uh, on, uh, you know, the international legal profession generally, and specifically methodological issues that arise therein. I know that uh, we have quite a few grad students today who will be interested in sort of the, the uh, uh, some of the publishing and, and um, you know, dimensions uh, of that. But there's also, uh, uh, there will also, I'm sure, be lots of questions about uh, what it means to be an international law uh, a lawyer today. Uh, so many things happening around the world, and I'm teaching the course this uh, this term, so I'm always reminded. But you know, it's never far in the news whether it's uh, Russia perhaps uh, invading uh, Ukraine tomorrow, or the continuous fallout of the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, no shortage of uh, really fascinating uh, international legal issues that remind us of, of you know the importance of that body of law. Glider. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being with us. Well, thank you, Frédéric. It's a, it's a really generous and personal um, welcome that you've given me, and I'm, I'm really touched. Um, and yeah, it would have been so lovely to come in person. Uh, but uh, indeed, I mean, I think I flew in on the 18th of December, and uh, Quebec shut down about one day later, something like that. Uh, it didn't reopen, but uh, I was visiting family, and we would have taken advantage of that opportunity to see one another. And it would have been great to come back. Um, that was part of the reason. So Frédéric and Jay and I go way back for different reasons. And we've been talking about how getting an alumnus to come back once in a while and say, hey, you know, things worked out. I did become an international lawyer. And here's how McGill helped me. I thought might have been a, a good way to start. And I, I did want to do that. I mean, I well, first of all, um, I would not mind if people turned on their cameras, because otherwise it turns very much into kind of me in the spotlight talking at you and seeing a bunch of names. But if I could, you know, if those of you um, who don't mind turning them on would, then at least it's a bit more personable and intimate between all of us. Uh, so I would invite you to do that. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, now, my, my feeling is that most of you are LLM and PhD students. 
um, or uh, DCL students. I think they might still be. We, we have a couple of, uh, of undergrads, uh, including oh, okay. uh, uh, at least one from my international law class. So, oh, fantastic. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so I was. Okay, that's terrific. And uh, I don't know if we can call it undergrad now that it's a JD. Um, Sorry, I, I, be, I meant that very, very loosely. Uh, I won't be trading in my LLB anytime soon. I'm very attached to it for nostalgic reasons, but hey. Um, but um, I've designed, I, I decided to pitch this conversation at a number of sort of levels because I figured that being up in Montreal, which is, you know, I mean, McGill is a research powerhouse, and I think for international law, probably Canada's most visible university. But at the same time, it's a little bit far from London, Paris, The Hague, even to a degree New York. And so I kind of wanted to, in a broad brush, tell my own story as a McGill graduate and what McGill brought to me, but then talk a little bit about why I specifically returned to academia and not staying in practice or in civil society or activism, even though I think fundamentally they're all related. And then I wanted to share a couple of reflections on methodology in the broader sense. Um, many of them will be driven by imperatives of conscience, you might see, but um, I'll explain and I'll try to give it scholarly weight. Um, so there's a combination of biography, probably not so humble bragging, that's not what I mean it to be. But I, I guess um, where I want to start above all, though, is to say that McGill was this incredible springboard that has brought me so much as a trans-systemic lawyer. Um, I am still pinned in as a common lawyer in Belgium, where I now teach, but I was very much identified as a civil lawyer in England, where I taught for 15 years. Um, that trans-systemic openness, I think, is like being raised by Lingyu. It teaches you one important thing, and I think Frédéric understands it because he also did the double maîtrise in Paris and London. But when you're trained from the start that your law is not the true law, but is one of many ways to read the law, I think from the outset that sets you up for international law so well because it does not give you a domestic home. It suggests to you that law can be subjective and different legal orders do things differently, and that is all right. And it's something that I struggle with in teaching theory even today, when I get my Belgian lawyers insisting that what is written down has primacy over what is not, and my common lawyers who insist that what judges do and what judges say is the way the law is and ought to be, and every lawyer, whether practitioner, academic, activist, must think like a judge. And I find those fascinating challenges as a teacher of law, as a practitioner of law, sometimes as a legal activist. So above all, what I wanted to say is cherish that. I was one of the last generation of the national program where you could opt into an LLB only and opt into a BCL only. And I remember being, I think I was in second, no, I was in second year when it was approved and then third year where the first classes were rolled out. But I still studied them separately. And I remember being fascinated by the way that law was moving into this integrated teaching. It is more unique than you think. And I think that that ethos permeates the faculty in a really useful way not only because it makes you think about law trans systemically but also because civil and common law are two of the dominant ways of thinking about international law so i'm presuming most of you here are interested in international or transnational law a lot of what i say will be pitched to someone who's thinking of a career in the academic profession or within the wider international law profession but some of it might have resonance if you want to engage in domestic law, constitutional law, perhaps less so. And I admit, having left Canada almost 20 years ago, um, the, 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 you can only pitch things so broadly, right? So anyhow, um, a bit of biography in that sense. So after leaving McGill, I went off to Leiden. I wanted to be near The Hague. I wanted to see how international law was practiced, maybe get an internship, maybe stay forever. I did get the internship, but then I went home. Um, very disappointed with that practice and decided that I, what I really wanted to do was to get a PhD. I wasn't sure if I wanted to do academia or practice or work for the UN, but I saw around me that to be taken seriously as an international lawyer, an awful lot of them had PhDs. So um, I went off to England. I, I, I was lucky enough to get a place at Oxford. That was back when tuition fees were just about affordable enough that you could fund your first year on your own and then scrabble for funding. Today, things are a bit different. But um, went off, did that for a couple of years. And then it was my McGill training that helped me to uh, pass the exams and be recruited at the ICJ. This is before the Judicial Fellowship Program, which I would encourage all of you who are thinking of international law to consider. McGill is one of the longest serving universities there. 
almost always represented from what I know, and it was an absolute eye-opener. And I spent three years there, to which I'll return in a bit. And then I decided I wanted to go into academia. And I was able to find a job in England. This was, you know, before children, before um, um, life settles down. i um, thinking I could always go back to Canada, but then, um, you know, settle down with a European, gets a bit more difficult to go home. So, so here I am, Europe is home now, and that works out. Um, when I started my PhD, and this is what I want to get to, I, I was very intrigued by theory. I was very intrigued by the critical legal studies, postmodern traditions that were really starting to grab the imagination of scholars, grab the imagination of academics. And it was back then, it was much less mainstream than it might be now, but it was something that I, I was kind of exposed to all in one shot, not McGill. This happened um, in, in Leiden, in fact, but uh, it charmed me and it was something I wanted to get into. But my supervisor was a dyed-in-the-wool positivist with practitioner experience. He'd been the legal advisor to the Foreign Office in the UK and was very much opposed to this. He, he, you know, he, he was incredibly patronizing in the best way. Um, my boy was his nickname for me, but you know, my boy. All of this theory is not going to help you to be taken seriously as an international lawyer. To be a respected international lawyer, you need to know the law. You cannot criticize the law unless you know the law. And this was something that stayed with me. And the reason I want to say this is, I'll return to it later, is one of the claims that I'm going to make today is that I do think that it is entirely possible to be a reflective, critical lawyer whilst taking the law seriously. And this is uh, maybe what uh, Frédéric refers to as um, being broad and having fingers and lots of pies. I might call it schizophrenic personally, but, <laughs> but I think it's important not to say that one excludes the other. As I progressed in my PhD, I um, well ran out of funding, but also I was writing on the ICJ and I realized that uh, I needed to have a little bit more experience on how the court actually worked. This was where my supervisor's comments became very relevant as to understanding the object of your critique. He always said, you can apply all your critical theories on judicial decision-making that you wish, but make sure they're grounded. So once a job popped up, I applied and I had the incredibly good luck of being shortlisted and sat the exams. The exams were in English and French. There again, the McGill bilingualism um, helps. Um, I, know, I know my accent probably doesn't reveal it, my name certainly doesn't, but I grew up in Shikudami. And uh, although I was educated in English, I grew up in French. And that was one of those wonderful gifts of being a Quebecer and having access to both languages. It helped me to succeed in the exams. And off I went to The Hague, where I worked first for the legal department and then for the judges uh, for almost four years, uh, drafting uh, reports and memoranda, um, drafting bits of paragraphs that might have or may not have made their way into judgments, I'll say no more, um, but also observing deliberations and seeing how, as um, my judge Bruno Zimmer would say, how the sausage gets made. That experience not only shaped my reasoning as an academic, but also shaped my understanding of the profession. Many of the judges had been professors in the previous life, but some of them had been professional legal practitioners pretty much their whole life or in government legal service. And seeing them come together and trying to find some common ground gave me the sense, for better or for worse, that international law is actually a quite unified profession where people can switch vocation and people can hold multiple hats, a sort of dédoublement professionnel instead of dédoublement fonctionnel to steal the expression from Georges Sell. That also gave me the confidence, even though I set out to a UN career and I hadn't quite finished my PhD, that if I wanted to go back to academia, I should, and I should try. So after defending my PhD, I was quite lucky. I, I, I applied for about four or five jobs. I got shortlisted for two and I got one. So, you know, very quickly went back to academia. And uh, part of it was for positive reasons. I missed the freedom of the university. I missed uh, the ability to speak with my own voice at the court. And this is something that one finds not so much in practice, but perhaps if you work for an international institution, you are very much a cog in the wheel of a much larger voice. In my case, whatever I did would eventually have to go through the judge's desk in order to be validated. And if the judge simply didn't agree, they had to give no reasons. They just don't agree and it doesn't go in there. Um, and I missed that academic freedom. At the same time, I also realized that I was walking away from a position of potential influence. I mean, after all, 
there are thousands of professors, but uh, there is only one UN. And being part of that machinery maybe gives you the opportunity to affect more change than less. So there were trade-offs, but I chose, I chose the academic space. I chose teaching. I missed the freedom. I missed um, the stimulation of students. And uh, I've stayed in academia ever since. But that said, and this is what I wanted to talk about a bit about, that practice experience irrevocably changed my methodology. It really brought to the fore to me that for at least some international lawyers, being able to use the toolbox that the profession uses, that practitioners, judges, activists, civil society deploy on a day-to-day -day basis is a valuable part of what we can do. And although sometimes I engage with lawyers or legal scholars, excuse me, who are completely uninterested in what legal professionals are doing. I think that for some of us, it behoves us, it's in our interest to maintain the proficiency of a technical lawyer. For that reason, I decided to write a textbook. Um, now it wasn't only for that reason. It was, also because, uh, it was also because some of my research was going very much in a theoretical direction. And when um, the publisher OUP that publishes my textbook came out, they said that they thought there was a gap in the market for a um, five to 600 page book that could be used in undergraduate and LLM teaching. That was not the big Shaw, the big Brownlee, but that could be a bit more accessible. Those are classics now. Those are books used by practitioners, by judges. And they thought something that's actually for students still needs to be out there. And I decided that it would be not just something for students, but also something for me to take my experience and practice, but also take my theoretical interests and try to fuse them together into something that would depart from the traditional teaching. International law is often taught as here are the facts, this is how the law is, and this is how international lawyers think without any sense of and this is subjective, and this is contingent, and this is historically driven, and it is Eurocentric, and it is colonial, etc. Many very, very critical scholars would suggest that even trying to teach international law in this way is an exercise in professionalization. It's an exercise in taking the next generation and passing on the same modes of thinking. And I remember when I decided to do this book, I thought, I'm going to be different. I'm going to break free. I didn't quite achieve. Um, there's a there's a tension, um, and and uh, you know I, I I don't want to like brag about the book and say go buy the book, but as I went through drafting this textbook, I found myself constantly thinking, this is wrong. This is law that I don't like. These are legal principles that I find problematic, or this way of narrating it, like the law on immunities, the law on jurisdiction, is completely Anglo-American. It's completely Eurocentric. It ignores what's been happening around the world. And then something kind of made sense. That is the story of international law. In many respects, international law cannot be decolonized because it is colonial. But naming it is part of that exercise. And teaching it in that way, accepting its limitations with a full sense of its history so that we do not accept that what is necessarily must be and or is the only way. To me was that necessary compromise between equipping the, let's say, 50% of my students who want to get jobs in the foreign ministry or the UN or NATO or one of the other international organizations and the other 50% who, well, if they're not going to go into corporate law, but might be thinking of human rights activism, might be thinking of going into academia and want to be exposed to other ways of thinking. And as a teacher of international law, there is this tension that runs across the way that I presented it in that book that also kind of re reinforced that sense that I have. The reason I'm sharing this is because I believe that whatever our choice, if we become international lawyers, whether it's an academic, whether it's a practitioner, activist, civil servant, et cetera, we have a certain responsibility in how we engage with it. We have a responsibility to get it right in a way, but at the same time, part of getting it right is to have the confidence in your own analytical abilities, to call the state a spade as it were, to say something is problematic, something is unjust, Against which standard? Well, my own personal standard of justice. 
is my personal standard of justice based on some sort of naturalistic conception of the world or a political ideology, fine. But one needs to justify it. And so what I wanted to share with you today was, because many of you might be masters or doctoral students thinking, what am I gonna do with this? What am I going to do with my research? What am I going to do with my argument? Am I writing for a certain audience? Well, in some respects you are, but in some respects you're also writing for yourself. You're writing to give yourself a training in how to argue rigorously. You're arguing to make yourself heard about a subject that I hope you feel passionately about, Hating it is also feeling passionate about it. Um, believe me, um, there, are, there are probably more moments where I hated my research than when I loved it. And most of the time I love my research the most when it's done and when it's behind me and sent to someone. But I think that there's this blend that you must accept in research and writing between doing it for yourself, doing it for the profession in the sense of making yourself heard, and also using it as training to discover your own voice. So for those of you writing big master's theses or PhDs, I want to give you a couple of little tips of wisdom that I only discovered quite late in life, but will go, hopefully, will be different than the ones that your supervisors are giving you. And the first one is, don't despair. Your thesis will probably be, if you have a successful career, the worst thing you will write and publish. And some of you might be like, it should be. It is a snapshot of who you are at this point in time. You will evolve. You will learn, you will read more things, you will challenge your views, you will have your views challenged, you will receive feedback. You should evolve as you pursue a research career, whether it's academic or professional. So, it should be that the first big research project that you do is the weakest. It should have holes. It should have gaps. You should work your best to fix them. But at the same time, especially with the PhD, it is but a sort of driver's license. It's a ticket for admission into a community where it helps you to be taken seriously. It proves that you can do something with a beginning, a middle, and an end that is reasonably coherent and has passed the jury of your peers. That is not a bad thing. The reason I say this is because I know too many brilliant lawyers who struggled to finish. To them, the PhD had to be the magnum opus or their masters had to be the best possible thing, not only that they were capable of doing, but that exists, that is out there. And they struggled. And they struggled emotionally, psychologically. And in these pandemic times, I do not think that we should, um, that we should um, how can I put it, um, underestimate mental health issues in this. A writing project can be lonely, but at the same time, it has to be something that you are able to have the confidence to set aside to move on. In this case, really, good enough is good enough. And although the standard is high, so good enough will be reasonably good. It is but a stepping stone. It is but a start. My second bit of advice is to think not only about what the structure or the argument should be. And on there, I think every good supervisor will tell you to break it up into achievable projects and then give it coherence as it develops. But also think about the audience and who it is for. And in a way, think about what it's going to do for you. Think about the training that you're giving yourself in respect of by whom you want to be taken seriously. Think about how you want to say this in order to be heard. Have the courage of your convictions because nothing is less convincing than a doctorate that someone has written because Ian Brownlee said it's X, so I, I guess I have to say it's X even though I think it should be Y. Yes, if you find yourself in a position where you just don't agree with the majority and you feel you need to say something, you might find yourself taking a risk, but at the same time, if you've thought it through, if you've reasoned it through, if you have justification for taking such a stand, then chances are your argument is at least plausible. You discuss it with your supervisor, you discuss it with your peers, you push the argument as far as it can go. But if it holds, have that courage of your convictions. In many respects, it's those convictions that will set you on a certain path. 
And that is, the, that is the point that I kind of want to conclude with about that path. And it is about the international law profession. Whatever your convictions about whether the law is necessary for order and structure, whether the law is inherently imperial and problematic, or whether the law is an instrument to getting a coveted judgeship or a nice job somewhere. International law is international law is international law. Whether you're an activist, an, a practitioner, a judge, an academic, engaging with the substance of the discipline makes you a better international lawyer. And this is a discipline where people cross over. Most academics have had some practice experience. Frédéric, I think you spent some time before um, before coming to Canada, also uh, in the field, didn't you? I seem to remember us having a discussion about this. Falls off, but but kind of briefly, a bit like you. But that, that's an interesting right. debate. Yeah. But you know, but but I, I I and I know some who spent a long time in practice, a long time in institutions, before going back to academia. I know some that have discovered academia late in life. I work with people at the European Commission who teach international law part time because they can't quite let go of the classroom and of writing, but their their job is in practice. And the further up you move, the more you see that people move from being legal advisor to professor to judge to high representative. It's a profession that allows that. And dare I say, my stage in one of the big Montreal corporate law firms was probably one of the areas where I learned a lot. I learned how to work in a team. I learned how to deliver high quality product in a very short time frame. I learned how to work till 3 a.m. <laughs> Sometimes you've just got to do it. Um, fortunately, not so much in academia, but I learned certain life skills that have served me well in getting things done. And even today, I, I sit in academic meetings sometimes and I think, gosh, in my law firm, we would have uh, shut down this debate three hours ago. And uh, that's, you know, almost 20 years from now. But my point is, all experience can be good experience. It depends what you take from it. So have the confidence to walk away from things you don't like, but don't be afraid to do things that don't set you on the exact path that you want to, so long as they keep you within international law, learning about things that could be one day relevant. The other thing is that there's never something too small. If you haven't published, fine. There's always a new case coming out. There's always a new development coming out that you can get practice in writing about. Most good journals will publish case comments, will publish um, recent developments by young scholars, people like you, it's how I got my first start. My first articles are a book review and a case note, um, an encyclopedia entry. There's no such thing as a bad publication. Small publications give you the confidence to go through peer review. They give you the confidence to take criticism from someone who's not your supervisor. They give you the confidence to put together something polished and small that has one core argument. And you build. You build from that into your first journal article. And then maybe you get invited to contribute to a book chapter. And that might give you the confidence to submit your thesis for a book publication. But too small doesn't exist. Even the 1,000 or 2,000 word book review, I think is a really good start. And finally, don't be overwhelmed by all these people that have 100 publications under their belt. Most of them have had 20 years to develop that experience. The early years are the years where you publish the least, you're finding your feet, you're finding your voice, you're figuring out which audience you want to speak to. It gets easier. I don't take three months to write a journal article anymore. Okay, since COVID, to be fair, publications are not great. I have a three-year-old and five-year-old in the house. <laughs> Let's be honest, you know, um, 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 quantity is not, um, is not ideal right now for parents of young children. But that said, no one cares. It's all about quality and to be taken seriously in the academic profession. We don't talk about so-and-so with 2,000 articles. We talk about James Crawford, who published that book that changed the field, or Marty Koskiniemi's From Apology to Utopia. We talk about the three or four core ideas that make people's careers. So think about your own ideas in that way. Think about whether they're defensible, whether you're comfortable with them in terms of your methodological academic conscience, and whether they fit in with what you want to do. And I've got one last thing. It is not selfish to put yourself first. It is not selfish to say, I don't want to live in poverty, or I don't want to do field work in these parts of the world. I want to have a family, or I want to have financial security, or what have you. I'm not here to tell you there's a right way to do it. What I'm here to tell you is that those are relevant considerations in how you determine your career path. 
And you must give yourself that confidence to say, this is what I want. This is what I and my partner or my family want. This is what's best for me. That is, I think, not only a question of career advice, but also a question of methodological confidence. Because if what you want is to work for the UN, you do not need to feel attracted to theories that you're not completely convinced of telling you that the UN is an imperial bureaucratic monstrosity that is out to consume the world. If you're not convinced by that and you still want to work for the UN, you do not need to buy into the argument because you think it's trendy. But similarly, you look at international judges, you look at successful international lawyers, and you think they're all positivists. All they do is describe, all they do is, is do black letter stuff. I don't want to do that. I'm not comfortable with that. Fine, then don't do it. Don't do it. Have the confidence to say, I think this is limited. I think this is problematic. Here's why. It took me a while to find my voice. I went from critical theory, and then I went to the court, and then I went back to theory, and then I decided to write this textbook. And I'm still, I mean, I'm still oscillating. I still haven't figured out where I will land. But every opportunity is an interesting one. Sometimes you've just got to seize them with both hands. And sometimes you've got to have the courage to say no. And so that's, I think, the last thing I want to end with. I, I realize I've talked a, a bit longer than I'd wanted to, but I wanted to end with that message to you. There is a blend of method, structure, academic stuff, and the personal in there. And you've got to find the balance that works for you. And I think that is that balance that makes one comfortable, not least to finish their master's or PhD, but to, to have the confidence to go out in the world and to, to, to become an international lawyer. Anyway, thank you so much for your time. Um, and um, I look forward to, uh, uh, to discussion. Please feel free to ask questions or to make comments or to attack me on anything. Um, I'm here for that. <laughs> All right, well, I, I don't think anyone is in the uh, spirit of attacking anyone. Uh, thanks a lot. Challenging, challenging, uh, sorry. <laughs> made, uh, there's a lot of virtual uh, 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 applauses. I think it would be you know, deafening if, uh, <laughs> if we were in presence. Uh, very helpful. Thanks really resonates and uh you know it's just uh remarkable i mean i i i you know i i, I really fully agree with many of the points that you've made and and uh, that some of the other points that i i try to make not not as eloquently to my uh llm uh students my dcl students who are to whom i teach legal research methodology um one thing i i wanted to stress maybe before we, we have questions is just that this, this is a wonderful example, Glider, that, that you've offered us of, uh, you know, uh, you know, the mixing the sort of personal narrative uh, with uh, a, an expose uh, and a discussion of the law, which which has its, you know, it, it is almost a genre now in, in uh, international legal writing. Uh, uh, you know, David Kennedy comes to mind as, as having uh, written, you know, these seminal articles, uh, Spring Break in the Texas Law Review, and then a, a, a sequel to that, where, you know, it basically recounts uh, he, and describes his reactions to uh, a conference he attended, and that's kind of the article, right? And and it's interspersed with remarks about himself and and you know what it means to be where he is, and and uh, you know one's position in a world and and where one comes from and and how one gets to where one is are all really important to the doing of international law. They're not, uh, you know, marginal autobiographical details. They are quite often uh, really uh, what defines what we do. And there's also a whole genre of, you know, re-exploring uh, international law thinkers by looking, you know, trying to understand their uh, academic production as a function of, you know, where they grew up and, you know, what university they attended and what kind of questions they're trying to address in the world. So, uh, you know, really important. And uh, uh, maybe one last uh, quick thing, you know, just on the anxieties and the rewards of publications. I, you know, I I like to think that what makes the international lawyer ultimately is the desire to be an international lawyer, and and so there's an inevitable um, uh, element of projection and and just sort of, uh, you know, wanting your ideas to be heard and wanting to publish, and that that's a key dimension. But also professionally, right? I mean, I think people uh, achieve things because they become identified with certain ideas and people uh, want to work with them for that reason. And, you know, in order for that 
notoriety uh you know to develop you you need uh to sort of you know be willing to sort of be visible anyhow so uh, uh enough said so questions uh, we have a mix of uh some of my uh llm uh students some dcls uh and and also uh, a couple of um jd students so questions yes lavinia uh, thank you so much, Professor Hernandez, for your uh, speech. It was really inspiring. Um, I have been aspiring to be an international lawyer for many years now. Um, so I really, it was nice to hear the first thing in the morning. Um, so a couple of questions, two very different questions. Um, first question is in regards to publishing. Um, nothing humbles you more than a publisher, um, I feel. So I was just wondering, how do you not get discouraged from you know when you when they write back and they say hey sorry we're not interested in publishing you um, and then they give uh, comments and stuff like that like how do you not get discouraged from that process because it can be quite uh, prohibitive sometimes to get into the publishing world um, at least initially yeah yeah well thank you for that I mean Lavinia honestly uh, still hurts to get peer review sometimes. And even full professors get knocked back once in a while. And, and, and you've got to find a way, so, so a couple of things. And Frédéric will understand what I mean. Some of the most successful people that I know get rejected a lot of the time. But it's when they're not rejected that helps them move up and helps them to achieve and helps them to become big names in the field. Um, one of the most successful people I know, you know, Rhodes Scholar, professor at the age of 37 or something like that, you know, like incredibly published. It's a big shoebox in his office. It's right behind his desk and it says rejections on it. And if you open it, it's full of rejections. A part of it is not to make it about yourself, is to take it in stride and to move on. Look, the world of publishing is changing very quickly. There are open access issues. Numbers of paperback copies and sales are going down. Publishers are trying to figure out how to build up repositories that they can then sell. Like um, uh, the one I know best is OUP. I was lucky enough to publish my monograph just before kind of the bottom fell out of monographs. They are still publishing them, but they're, they're different now. But what they do is um, th th they're really focusing on quality, but at the same time, they are concerned about um, marketability and things like that. And sometimes it's not all about you. Moreover, although I'm a big fan of peer review in some respects, it has its weaknesses. Sometimes they ask the wrong person and that person is worried that you're treading on their turf or that person feels threatened by a posture that you're taking, you're challenging something they built their career on. You have to learn not to make it about yourself. If you believe in the feedback, if you think it's fair and justified, you integrate it and you move on. There are enough journals in the US, you know, with the espresso system, you just go through them. There are a lot of good journals in Europe. You will find somebody. The second thing, though, is I would say, be, beyond starting with book reviews and case notes that, you know, the review process is a bit lighter, but it will help you with style. It'll help you with use of sources, arguments, structure, all of those things that push you forward. But also, some of the most brilliant young international lawyers that I know did not go and publish in the American Journal or the European Journal right away. They started with a piece in a second or third tier journal. They got confidence in a peer review process. They understood how to integrate criticism and they moved up and they moved around and they published here and they published there. It's okay to start with a respected journal that is not top tier. Um, I mean, the Revue Québécoise comes to mind. You know, it's a good journal, good review process, very decent. You want to get known outside? Look at journals like the Nordic Journal of International Law, the Netherlands Yearbook of International Law, the Cambridge Journal of International Law. You know, these journals that are not established for long, but where the review process is rigorous and you can cut your teeth, get the confidence to receive the feedback. Aiming for the stars in that way can be counterproductive. And I think. I think it's okay if it hurts, but I think you have to develop a way to develop a thicker skin and move on. And honestly, I should take my own advice. Sometimes I've received reviews that are equivocal 
and then I've kind of sat on them for a year or two. And then COVID happens and suddenly, you know, I think Frederick knows what I'm talking about, but you know, you, you get equivocal things, you take them a bit too seriously, you think I really need to rework this. And all of a sudden, it's bigger than it needs to be. And so my advice is, you know, don't make it all about yourself and start to gain momentum by doing small things to get yourself confidence. Then you get to know the procedure, you get to understand it. I do a lot of peer review myself now. And so that helps a lot as well. So if you get a chance to serve on a journal or if you get a chance to serve on a blog or a working paper series as an editor, that's also another way to get to know the process, to get experience, even if you're assisting a professor who does it. That's another way to kind of demystify the process. Great, thank you so much. I'll ask the second question after, um, so then my peers can have more time as well. But thank you, that, that's extremely helpful. Thanks, Lavinia, uh, great, a uh, good, good idea. Uh, Maria. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Hernandez. That was uh, very uh, um, kind of uh, hopeful <laughs> uh, coming from an LLM uh, student who feels that uh, she's like late into publishing. <laughs> uh, I had a question about, you know, at the beginning you mentioned that uh, you, you wanted to go to Europe because international law is kind of there. Uh, and that's one of my fears. I'm, I'm uh, Colombian Canadian, but Montreal now is my base. Um, and I kind of feel that if I want to pursue a career in international law, uh, that's not necessarily in academia, but in practice, I have to move somewhere else. So mm -hmm. I wanted to get your thoughts uh, uh, on that. And then if, if we have time also kind of uh, what do you think about um, spending more time also uh, learning and, and studying more like the traditional international law kind of um, uh, theory and, and concepts uh, when one wants to focus more on human rights specifically. Two different questions, but yeah. yeah. Thank you, Maria. Um, I'll address those in turn. Um, on the human rights question specifically, I would say this is that question of audience, you know, by, by whom do you want to be taken seriously? With whom do you want to establish credibility? I would say one of the actually very helpful ways to do that is to see what people a bit older than you are doing and see what their career path has shown and see if there's anything in there that you also want to do internships at NGO X or Y, or a master's in this program. And, you know, go and kind of examine whether these are the sorts of things that are interesting for you that you want to do, um, and build your career, basically based on those people that you respect a little bit more senior than you. I think that's probably a bigger source of inspiration. I mean, for me, it was really public international law, you know. Um, so I kind of did that. And I have to admit that I didn't start with people of my age, but this was at the beginning of the internet. This was when people barely had online biographies. You could not see what people are doing. And you kind of just look, okay, well, well you know, I don't know, James Crawford does this. Um, I'll go there. No, it doesn't work that way. But you know, um, um, you, you, build, you build certain trajectories. I think in human rights, there is a wealth of, well, first of all, there are all the regional institutions, the various courts, being Colombian, Canadian, you probably speak Spanish, which really helps in the inter-American and um, human rights system. Um, but there's also a great network of NGOs, some of which are based in Montreal, that you can get involved in, try to get experience working on special projects. I think the internet is changing that. Like in 2002, going to The Hague was a natural thing to do in a way. And I was also, you know, 22, unattached. It wasn't too expensive back then. I could take out loans. It was a different time in a way. But at the same time, in today's networked world, with hybrid facilities being the way, there's nothing wrong with saying, this is my home, this is my base. I will explore. I mean, where is McGill in the world rankings right now? Is it 12th, 15th in the world? Something like that. You know, that's about as good as you get. You will be in the right networks. You have access to those from that base. And although there's nothing that stops you from moving around, if for personal reasons you decide that that's going to be the base, I still think you can have a fulfilling and successful international career. It might just take a slightly different path than, um, I don't know. Um, if you want to work on international courts and tribunals, maybe you will have to come to The Hague eventually and spend some time. But if you want Montreal to be your home base and you want to work in international human rights law, 
there's a lot that you can do on human rights issues that are that have resonance and on which there's practice and scholarship and research taking place in Canada. I mean, from my perspective as someone born in Canada, but pretty much I would say, I mean, I also have a British passport, but after Brexit, I'm not so proud of it. Uh, but I would say that I'm kind of like a, a Canadian who's an immigrant to Europe. So I'm, I'm a European Canadian with background from other parts of the world, but, but I'm an immigrant here. I'm a new European. Um, this is my home and this is my present, but Canada is my past, it's where I come from. But one of the things that I look back and I see that there's so much interest in scholarship specifically, well, one is on legal pluralism, cultural accommodation, trans-systemic stuff that McGill has propelled. But the other one is on indigenous rights. And indigenous rights are not only about the indigenous, they are also about collective versus individual rights, community rights versus collective rights, reconceptualizing the accommodation and overlapping communities. There's a colonialist and decolonizing discourse taking place in Canada that's very different than would be taking place in Europe. And those are things that you can bring to a global conversation from that base. So I would say, if staying in Canada is personally important to you, then find a compromise where you can still do something that you love, but that doesn't automatically force you to go away. And there's nothing wrong with short stays abroad and not having to do what I did, which is kind of swan off for a year and then never come home. Um, that, that, that isn't for everyone and that's okay. Um, um, now, one last thing about that. A lot of people leave for a few years, but then they make their way home. And you know, in my particular case, it really is because I fell in love with a Dutchman and we have two kids now. Um, Otherwise, I miss my parents, I miss my country, um, you know, and at one point I got sick and tired of living in the north of England and I wanted to be somewhere where they speak French, I live in Brussels now. And that, that brings me closer to Montréal, right? But um, those are personal choices and it's okay to let the personal structure the professional. And I know lots of expatriated Canadians who went abroad and stayed abroad. And I know a lot who wandered for a bit and then went home. And I think you can do international law like that. I know Canada sometimes feels semi-peripheral. It's part of our mindset, but it's from my perspective, it is not so peripheral after all. So I, I, I do think, especially in Montreal, with the rich tradition of NGOs, with the powerhouse universities that McGill and UDM and UCAM and Concordia are, I think you can build a very successful international law career it might just be it might just have to be a bit more specific you know you might not be able to do i don't know um trade law or wto law in quite the same way but even then you can go to ottawa and work for the nafta tribunals you know so it, it's just a question of kind of finding a niche that lets you have the personal life that you want as well but i think there is enough work thanks uh, guys we have a few hands raised uh i'm uh, rambling i'm sorry yeah wonderful and um yeah, we could discuss Montreal. It is it is a fascinating place that's kind of both at the center and at the periphery in many ways. Uh, Vishaka. Hi, sorry, I can't switch on my camera, but I'm not a talking cat. Um, I want to kind of uh, take you a bit more on the side of the professional also being a personal um, activity but as a DCL student it feels like there's not a lot of space in the thesis writing process or the final product to reflect the personal journey you go on in selecting that particular topic but as well the journey you go while you do a PhD project especially if you buy into the um, idea that legal writing is subjective and when you go into a critical project you can't really hide behind the sub like the objectivity of the black letter law um i feel especially in international law because you're commenting on what's going on in different countries you feel kind of small like why should your subjective um understanding of this matter um, something that you know happens on the other side of the world so um and and i feel like it in law especially you don't get a lot of space for that as would in anthropology for example where you know there's a lot more uh, embracing of those subjectivities um and personal storytelling so mm -hmm. i just want to understand how as a 
TCL student where there are certain academic frameworks you have to follow, um, how do you include that personal dimension into your work? That's a great question. Um, Shaka, thank you. Uh, well, a couple of things. One of them is that I would say there's a time and a place. So there are certain pieces that I write in which my journey doesn't matter. There are other pieces that I write that are precisely on the sociology of the international legal profession, where my, my situationality, you know, as, as, as a male from the global north who has studied in, you know, um, respected institutions, who works in a, in, in a well-ranked university, those things define my perspective. And as such, it's important to kind of frame them, if for no other reason than to confine them. Um, I guess my first point thus would be, it depends. It depends on the type of research you're doing and it depends on why you're doing it. The second, I think is, I actually think that there's a certain modesty in how you're presenting yourself vis-a-vis -vis the object of your research. And I think that that modesty is a good thing. That modesty will inspire you to continue to interrogate and reflect why you're doing this. Why, if this is occurring on this side of the world, you've decided to study it. And whether you think it's possible from that side of the world to comment meaningfully on what is happening. I think part of you becoming a better researcher is to constantly interrogate that rather than to say, I am qualified. This is something that everyone can understand no matter where they're from. But what I would encourage you to do is rather than to let that cloud you in terms of doubt, let that inspire you to justify that better. And I think, I think you know, there's a strong community of scholars at McGill that are versed in what we would call sort of socio-legal studies. And there is an emerging tradition of, oh God, what do I want? Um, um, Frederic, help me out here. What is Luis Slava doing these days? It's not uh, an anthropology. Well, it's, kind of uh, well, it's everyday international law. International law in the okay. everyday, yeah. But what is he calling it? What is he calling it again? Um, uh, Luis Slava Luis is a Colombian scholar now based in Kent, who, by way of Melbourne, and I think Harvard even, but he, he's calling it, it's not it's ethnography. That's right. So there is an emerging tradition amongst international lawyers, especially in the critical traditions, to blend disciplines. So legal ethnography, legal anthropology, legal sociology. Um, there are those that are doing law and economics. If those are disciplines that speak to you better, then train yourself in them. Give, that will probably give you the confidence to comment more meaningfully on the sort of research project that you've developed. Do you mind me asking, what is it that you're doing in your DCL? Um, I'm doing a cultural um, cultural critique of international humanitarian law, specifically on suicide bombers' deaths. And okay. um, I am taking an ethnographic writing class these days, and this is um, immensely helpful. I envy people who do ethnographic research. Um, unfortunately, I am doing legal research, but I'm using ethnographic um, research as a secondary resource. Um, okay, but, okay. Uh, yeah, but I, I understand um, how that type of thinking can be helpful. Thank you for pointing me to the other scholar as well. No, my pleasure, my pleasure. I mean, honestly, that's hard work. And don't let anyone tell you that interdisciplinarity is easy. It isn't. I really struggle with it and I tend to confine myself. I mean, I did a little bit of philosophy, a little bit of sociology, you know, um, but not even that much of that because I was one of your sea shepherds. So, you know, I, I was that 18 year old sitting on the lawn with the person with a master's degree in economics next to me and the person with a doctorate in medicine next to me, you know, uh, I'm feeling an awful lot like legally blonde back then. Um, and it worked out, but I'm very much a lawyer's lawyer. And that's because my first degree was in law. So I, I understand that. And I have the modesty to say, I don't have the tools for this. I think you going out and seeking those tools because you are doing this kind of study is a good thing because that modesty is giving you the, it's giving you the openness to go look for the tools to shift your research project. And I think with good supervision, your supervisor will help you to figure out what you can do, what maybe you can't do at this stage, but look at these types of research as a career. You do it in stages. You do what you can do well now, 
You train yourself to do the next step and you go and do that next. But you don't have to do it all at once. Again, it doesn't have to be the best thing that you ever write. So, you know, go and get those ethnographic tools that help you with the here and now and continue to refine them. There are many scholars who get a second PhD or spend years and years and years transitioning over. I mean, the dean of my law school in Durham before had never studied law. He started off doing political philosophy. He moved into theories of punishment, lots of Hegel, slowly moved into theories of criminal law, became the dean of a law school with no legal training. Still mostly writes about punishment and criminal law in that way, but he can teach a criminal law class now. Sometimes interdisciplinarity kind of happens naturally, and it's okay to let that happen to you. We have one last question from uh, Paul. Yeah, thank you, Professor Hernandez, for uh, you talk very, very inspiring, really uh, reassuring for for a, a lot of the students. I'll go quick because I know we uh, are uh, running out of time. I um I wanted to say that it's uh, I think it's really important uh, what you said about uh, Nino, uh, it being okay to let the personal uh, not dictate but be a, an incredible important matter in 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 choices of career you make. Um, for me, for example, you know I'm from I'm from uh, Paris, France, and uh, during my LM that I finished, I specialized in uh, international arbitration, and so a lot of people telling me this is great. You know, you can go back to Paris, work in the uh, uh, Chambre de Commerce International, um, have a lot of opportunities, but I, I really feel like Montreal is my home now, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to settle, I'm going to, uh, to live uh, my life here, so as you said, I think it's important to uh, let that be a choice, and on that note, my question will be related to it, because um, so I'm currently, uh, you know, uh, studying for having the uh, equivalency, being able to pass the Quebec bar, um, mm -hmm. and all that, that things, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of afraid to, uh, of, of, um, um, going into the, the, the professional world, the, the more practical side of law, you know, maybe big law, maybe, you know, um, regular lawyering, lawyering, uh, lawyer things. And my question is, how do you not lose touch with um, writing and, and academia um, on, 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 on really practical terms, you know, once uh, I'll be done with my stash, potentially starting in a law firm, because you, you you want to eat and you want to eat good things. I think that's another reason <laughs> for, for doing that. Um, how do you keep writing? Um, do you just you know get into professors, uh, ask them if they need help on a on a on an article? Do you uh, embark on writing on your own sometimes? Um, you know, just on your own and 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 treat it out to uh, to journals. Yeah, mm -hmm. these were my my questions, and and thank you again for uh, for the talk. No, it's my pleasure, um, Paul. Um, yeah, eating nice things in Montreal is not as easy as it was in my time. Um, prices have gone up. Um, but that said, uh, there are those food trucks, right? And that magnificent full on good dinner. Um, no, no, I, all kidding aside, I understand where you're coming from. And if, especially if, especially when you're an immigrant thinking kind of, but I want to stay here, you might be prepared to make a few professional compromises to be able to do it. And I think there was a moment where I really, really wanted to stay in Europe and I, was willing to cross over with my bar and I was going to go into practice maybe and I wanted to stay in the UN, even though it really, really wasn't for me. And it's not for, for no other reason that it wasn't for me. Um, but I would say a couple of things. One, again, it's okay to choose the personal and then shift kind of to what the market has. So if you really want to stay in Montreal, that's becoming your home and you want to do international law, have a cold, hard look at what kind of international law is being practiced, what kind of international law is in the NGOs. Um, if you're going to do a stage, look for those law firms that do investment arbitration. Be very practical, do, do, do NAFTA arbitration. If that's the kind of stuff you wanna do and not the more human rights litigation, um, public interest litigation, which I think would have an international law component. Although then that would be in the smaller firms because the big law firms that say they do human rights mostly do freedom of expression for large corporations. You know, um, yes, I went there. <laughs> um, but there is a diversity in the practice community in Montreal where you can find your way if you're single-minded about what you want to do and you're a little bit flexible about how you're going to do it. That is a separate question than making sure that you find the time to write. That is hard. Leaving a, a research or um, an academic vocation where you have time to write, where it's part of your job description, you're going to have to find a way to make the time. 
And that is not always easy. Now, there are areas of practice where having the experience of publishing and presenting at conferences is a good thing. You just have to be very assertive about doing that. So write about things, maybe at the beginning, write about current developments, recent cases, try to go and participate in practice practitioner conferences where you can speak, where they force you to develop a paper, where you think about that. It is possible. Um, I get the impression that uh, a lot of practitioners in Montreal do find the time to write. I mean, it's not the sort of stuff that Frédéric would write or that I would write probably, but at least they're writing. And you see that law firms take that seriously. So as you go searching for that stage, maybe be a bit upfront about that. Not necessarily, I want to be a professor, but rather, I really like academic writing. I really like legal writing. And you know, what kind of arrangement can I have to maintain one toe in this as I get started? But that will require research on your part to figure out where you want to go and how you want to do it. I mean, Montreal is one of them is an unusual place because it's got four universities, it's got ICAO, it's got a lot of NGOs, and it's you know, it's not a capital, so it's not mobbed by government lawyers. It's actually quite a diverse environment find a sort of place that suits you. And maybe that place will be an NGO that doesn't allow you to eat very well. But um, on the other hand, then you'll be happy, right? And I think, I do think that you are all young enough that if you choose something that makes you satisfied, you'll probably be very good at it. And that will allow you to have professional success later down the road. I mean, on guys, okay, by way of ending, I know we're out of time, but um, when I left the UN and went to my first academic job, I took a two-thirds pay cut, and it hurt. But then you even out of it. I was still young enough, I was 29, I think, or 30, that I could do that. So sometimes it's, you know, you, you do short-term pain for long-term gain, and that is okay too. But I think, I mean, with a graduate degree from McGill and speaking French and English, you, you should be fine to be able to settle in Montreal. Um, I, I certainly hope so. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Glader, and thanks to everyone for their questions. This was really what I hoped it would be, a uh, kind of excursion through the challenges and travails, but also all the <coughs> hope that comes with uh, leading a, uh, you know, a flourishing career in international law. This is uh, complex, but also possible. Uh, so thanks for reminding us of that, uh, Glider. I would just like to mention uh, in passing that um, we have, uh, as Glider mentioned, we have uh, uh, the uh, International Court of Justice Clerkship Program. Uh, typically, we receive half a dozen applications, which and there's an internal selection first. Uh, uh, much to our dismay this year, we have had zero applications. Uh, this is, you know, one of the best clerkships anywhere in the world. Uh, uh, people may have missed the ad and it doesn't help, of course, but we're all online. The deadline has now been extended to next Monday. You can reach out to Sharon if you have questions about this. Uh, Obviously, and you can also contact me if you want to know more about your chances, send me a CV, etc. I mean, it is a highly competitive process and they do value people with, uh, you know, some kind of uh, international law exposure uh, already, but things can, uh, you know, also happen very fast. And we've had cases uh, in the past of people getting this and then that obviously kind of fully launching the, their international law careers because it really is a sort of, uh, you know, one of the best ways to uh, do it. All right, uh, Glider, thanks again. And uh, if I may <laughs> say, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know if I'm at liberty to disclose, but Glider is struggling with uh, the symptoms of uh, uh, what may be an emerging COVID. So we're particularly uh, grateful to him for uh, soldiering on despite. Uh... Well, thank you, Frédéric. Yeah, um, my kids were exposed. The school's been shut. They've been home all week. And we've been, for three days, the adults have been kind of sniffling. I want to say one last thing just about this ICJ clerkship, guys. This is a nine-month opportunity to go to The Hague on a salary and work for a judge of the International Court. The McGill students that I've seen go through there go far and wide. They become academics, they join the UN, they go home. Think about it. It's a really, really great opportunity. And the other one is the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which I think McGill also sends interns to, right? Yeah. Yeah, those, they're really very, very good. Um, use those opportunities. McGill's ranking and reputation 
can take you very, very far. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, uh, um, I'm shocked to hear that no one has applied, but I can see why. Can I say one last thing? It's um, a weird, yeah. Can, and I know that you guys go, but um, McGill and Leuven, as of this week, have just concluded a double master's agreement. I've been negotiating it with uh, Associate Dean um, Andrea Bjorklund. Um, it's not fully for signature yet, but it will be for the McGill LLM thesis students. And with us, it will be with our LLM community. And we're hoping to take applicants in September. So if any of you are interested, um, drop me an email. Or if you know someone who might be interested in combining your McGill studies with a Leuven degree, uh, let us know, because this is something we'll be inching off the ground next year and launching properly uh, for the generation after you guys. Wonderful. Well, yeah, that, that was all. Yeah. That's uh, uh, new to me, and I think it's uh, it's great. We've never had a program like this in the past, so uh, fantastic to hear. All right, thank you very much to everyone. Uh, Glider, I hope you get better. Thanks again for being with us. Talk soon. It's been a pleasure. Take care, everyone.